so time to start. I uh, see that uh, participants are really like shuffling in. Of course, it's great uh, uh, to have uh, Joshua here. So Joshua Benjo is a professor in computer science at the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at uh, Université de Montréal. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's very easy to give an introduction about Joshua if you want to keep it short, otherwise it would be very hard. So Joshua is uh, uh, the recipient uh, of uh, the 2018 uh, uh, Turing Award for his uh, seminal work uh, with uh, Hinton and Lecun in uh, uh, deep learning. He has been a uh, uh, CIFAR chair, CIFAR fellow, uh, uh, scientific director of IVADO, uh, Data Science Institute in Montreal, Quebec Institute of um, uh, Learning Algorithms in Montreal. So I could add uh, much more than this, but uh, uh, personal note, uh, I've been spending uh, seven years in Montreal and it was a fantastic experience to be uh, Joshua's colleague and, uh, and uh, working uh, with him, close to him. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, your uh, uh, acceptance for coming to actually, at least virtually to give us this seminar and uh, floors is your, floors, floor is yours. <clears throat> Grazie Andrea. And thanks for the kind words. Um, okay, let me share my screen. So today I will talk about the sort of my current research program, how surprising, um, at least to some aspects of it that are close to my heart. And, and the title is Extending Deep Learning to High Level Condition and Scientific Discovery with Amortized Bayesian Causal Modeling. That's a lot of words. So you can see deep learning, uh, as Andrea said, this has uh, been uh, many decades of my life and also uh, doing that, trying to understand the limitations of our current deep learning. Um, so I will suggest that we can find an explanation for the gap to human intelligence by looking at high level cognition um, and uh, talk about how we can use inductive biases that are inspired by human cognition to extend deep learning. And this is what we've been doing for a few years. But more recently with uh, the uh, COVID crisis, I got into uh, the application of these ideas to scientific discovery, uh, you know, thinking about drug discovery, starting with antivirals for COVID, but then uh, other interesting questions. I realized that there were a lot of uh, challenging problems for machine learning there, um, and that the techniques we were working on could be uh, quite applicable. So I'll talk about Bayesian things and causal things and how neural nets, which are essentially a way to amortize the intractable computation, um, could be useful there. So that's the abstract I just gave you. And um, let's start with uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges for machine learning today, um, both at the theory level and the application level. Uh, it's the problem of uh, generalizing beyond the training distribution, also known as out of distribution generalization. Our current theory essentially requires all the data to come from the same distribution. So we we you have uh, ways to understand how we can generalize to uh, new examples from the same distribution. But what about if the distribution is different? Well, if you don't assume anything else, then there's nothing you could say, of course. But humans do that all the time. Um, and they are able to quickly adapt to these uh, modified distribution. And I'll give examples of that. And in an attempt to understand uh, how they do that, um, I will look at um, other weaknesses of current deep learning, uh, abilities to reason, yeah, and to some extent, but often like very poorly and you know why yes in some cases and no in other cases, we don't quite understand. Um, and now I'll, I'll try to, uh, again, take inspiration from how humans think and reason to suggest that it has in part uh, to do with knowledge representation and knowledge reuse and modularization um, and being able to uh, uh, compute and reason um, 
uh, not just based on all the experience and data that we have, but also introducing information that comes say, directly in natural language, like instructions from humans. Okay. Um, let's uh, start with uh, a little bit of a discussion about causality and out of distribution generalization. So how could it even make sense to talk about um, generalization to a modified distribution? Well, um, think about physics. Um, the distribution of images on Earth is quite different from the distribution of images on the moon. And we can actually make sense of those images, even though you know we may have seen uh, you know the first time we see them. Um, so uh, this is true in general when we understand the physics of something, the so dynamics, the dynamical equations that govern a system. Um, and here there's something interesting going on, which is that knowing the causal structure, knowing knowing, knowing the laws of physics, um, is not sufficient to determine how things look like, the distribution. It also depends on initial conditions. The conditions on Earth and the conditions on the moon are different. So, so we see that maybe there's uh, uh, a possibility to describe not just one distribution, but a whole family of distributions that share the same causal mechanisms, but somehow have other things that are different, like these initial conditions. So, uh, so I, I would like to uh, emphasize this, uh, this view that we can formally talk about out of distribution generalization if we talk about a family of distributions and then we need to specify how the members of the family are related to each other. If they are completely unrelated, then there's nothing we can do to generalize to a new distribution. But in the case of a causal model, which is different from a, 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 a statistical distribution, what we have is indeed a family of distributions, but where all of the distributions share the same parameters. It's, it's, the parameters are you know, the causal mechanisms that that's um, the same uh, on the moon and, and on earth. And so uh, if we are exposed to, to some of those distributions and we figure out the parameters of these causal mechanisms, then we may be able to meaningfully generalize to, um, uh, to new distributions from that family. So uh, these distributions, uh, how are they related to each other? They share the same parameters, but what's different? It's that you have different interventions, like, like the initial state in my moon and earth example, but it could be something more subtle, like um, uh, introducing a drug in your body. So that's gonna change the distribution of uh, activities in, in your cells. Um, and uh, but it doesn't change the mechanisms. So if we see enough of these interventions, we're able to, to generalize to new interventions. Um, okay. Um, th there is um, also some interesting inspiration we can get by looking at linguistics. And um, there's a notion in linguistics of uh, systematicity, which in machine learning we simply call systematic generalization. So this is about a particular way that humans are able to generalize to things that are completely unlike what they've seen, but well, not completely. The things that have zero probability under their, their training distribution, but can, you know, we can still make sense of like, like this vehicle that does not exist, but we can kind of make sense of it based on the vehicles we already know. Um, and you can think of even more drastic things like science fiction scenarios that you know that couldn't e could not even exist, but still we can make sense of them because they are about composing pieces we already know. And I'll give you an example of uh, driving in a new city, for example. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of literature now documented documenting in various ways how state of the art in machine learning can fail when you test them um, outside of their training distribution. So I'm going to uh, propose the hypothesis that a lot of those problems are actually due to one unique cause, that's convenient, um, that we're kind of lacking some of the key abilities that in humans are associated with conscious processing. Um, and, that, you know, and, and thus pointing the way to 
fixing the problem by both uh, understanding better what, what is going on at, at that level in human brains and incorporating the principles behind that uh, in uh, machines. So let me give you uh, an example uh, that um, uh, you, you know you, you should recognize something close to what you, you you probably lived as well, which is you're faced with a novel or very rare situation. And what happens is instead of going by your habit and your impulses, you think about what you're doing. You you call upon your conscious attention to carefully decide what you're gonna be doing. And when you do that, typically you will combine on the fly at the moment where it's needed, the appropriate pieces of knowledge so that you can uh, find solutions and imagine solutions. Actually, they're gonna pop up um, to you. So there's this different way of, uh, of your brain to compute when you are in these novel situations. And by the way, these novel situations are also interesting because there are situations where you're learning. Um, and, and, um, and your working memory is a sort of a bottleneck with only like five items um, through which almost everything that you learn and that you can uh, explain to someone else later um, goes through. Um, so I use this example of driving on the left or on the right. Uh, if you have been driving uh, in the US of you, all, you have all your life and then you, you get to Australia or to the UK where it is this one rule, major thing that has changed, but it's just this one rule. You can you know write it on, on, the, on a sign like, like there in the big figure. Um, and so it'd be nice if we had systems that can keep everything we already know and just change one little thing and adapt the behavior potentially in drastic ways accordingly. Um, and, and this sort of thing has been studied by uh, cognitive scientists and neuroscientists for many decades. Um, I, I learned a lot, uh, for example, from uh, work by Daniel Kahneman, um, Thinking Fast and Slow where he talks about two kinds two, ki two kinds of modes of operation of the brain. And I think the word, he uses the term system, but I don't like it. Um, in fact, these two modes coexist most of the time. So uh, the, 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 uh, the system one uh, mode of operation is uh, the unconscious type. Uh, it's, it's the intuitive type. It's, uh, it happens in parallel. You can't really explain what is going on, but you're doing a good job. And, um, and that's very much like what we do with deep learning these days. Um, we can train these neural nets. Uh, it basically, they have to practice a lot in order to get really good at something, but they can get really, really good at it. And it's hard to extract a verbalizable knowledge from that. And then of course, we have the conscious processing where it's much slower, uh, sequential, uh, logical. Uh, we can explain verbally what is going on. We can uh combine pieces of information of information from various places to reason to plan and uh and, and this is although there's been some progress this is still something lacking in current deep learning and so um it's interesting because uh it might also be a key to this problem of out of distribution generalization uh it, it allows to manipulate first of all abstract concepts and and recombine them on the fly in order to solve problems in new ways so, so these pieces of knowledge, I think that's, that's really important too. Like how do humans break knowledge into pieces and um, in, in the way that uh, we can consciously reason about them and communicate them to other human beings. Um, it, it, you know, it should be pretty straightforward and, and simple. And, and a lot of classical AI was focusing on that question, but, but it's not clear how to bring that inductive bias that um, type of uh, constraint and or preference in current deep learning. And a lot of my recent work has been about that. Um, what makes things complicated, of course, is that you know, this is still machine learning. We don't want to just be given the knowledge. We'd like to be able to discover it and break it into pieces, factorize it in the right recomposable pieces. Um, so in the last few years, I, uh, I've been kind of 
trying to organize my thoughts about this and what I've learned from the literature into a set of inductive biases. In other words, uh, preferences about how to solve problems or how to represent uh, uh, information that uh, is, is uh, characteristic of system two operations in, in our brains and that uh, uh, we could benefit from if incorporated in, in uh, state-of-the-art machine learning. So, so one aspect uh, that I already mentioned is modularity. Uh, some figures that have been proposed is that there may be something like you know, 10 million experts, uh, uh, pieces of very specialized knowledge somehow in, in your cortex um, that could be dynamically selected um, with your conscious attention in order to compose new solutions to problems. Um, and that is related to another inductive bias, which I mentioned already, which is that your uh, conscious attention and your working memory can only handle a handful of items at a time. And of course you can chunk them and you can go sequentially like one sentence at a time or something. Uh, so there's a way to handle more complicated things, but, but it goes through this bottleneck. Um, and we know also that the content of working memory is available to the whole cortex. So it's like if um, the information that is selected and uh, the content that is generated is going to be uh, these few like five-ish items are going to be shared to um, all of these experts. And you know how does the brain decide which uh, modules or which uh, entities are going to be selected? Um, there's a competition and also a cooperation because multiple pieces think about words in a sentence. So they kind of cooperate to construct one meaning, but they also compete with all the other sentences that you could think about. And this raises a question that hasn't been looked at very much in machine learning. If you have latent variables like these thoughts, how do you do inference in a probabilistic sense if you're only allowed to look at very few of these variables at a time? Um, one of the uh, strongest inductive biases that uh, I connect with uh, the, the, this bottleneck is that of sparsity of the high level dependencies. And you can see this in sentences. Um, uh, actually, I have a slide. I have a slide about this. So consider a sentence like, if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground. It's incredible if you think about it from a machine learning perspective that uh, you're making a prediction about a variable given just uh, you know a handful of others, and the prediction is very very strong. It's it's going to be true most of the time. Um, in general, this is not possible. If I try to predict a pixel from four other pixels, uh, you know, however I choose these other pixels, it's not going to be a very good prediction. So it's like if. Um, there are uh, these particular inductive biases that are true for things like words, high level concepts that we think about, but not true at low levels of representation. And we ought to use these sort of constraints, uh, these sort of uh, uh, regularization, maybe on the sparsity of the dependencies between these abstract variables. Um, right. Um, yeah, then there's this the sequential aspect that I mentioned. Um, and and then I, I, I started talking about causality. Humans think a lot about causality. Like we always, I mean, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm always asking myself, why, why, why? And, um, and, and, and so we have the machinery for this. Uh, we might not do it perfectly. Um, and, and I think it's also related to the action part in us, because uh, as I'll try to explain, causality is a lot about how things could be different if we acted, like if we intervene and we change something and being able to generalize to this new distribution that arises when, when we intervene on, on some uh, of these variables. Okay, um, so uh, when we started deep learning, um, about 15 years ago, uh, well, I guess more, um, it, 
it, uh, you know, it, one of the thoughts was, so this was the days of post machines. And the thought was, would like to discover representations, of course, that's been the hallmark of deep learning, but would like the higher level representation to be about the explanatory factors of the data. And really that means the causal variables. And these variables are not gonna be independent. Unlike a lot of the uh, literature in the last decade on disentangling, uh, we want to disentangle them, but they're not independent. They, they are dependent in very peculiar ways that have to do with the causal structure. And so what we would like from our systems is both to discover the relationship between the high level causal variables um, and the raw inputs and outputs, as well as this uh, causal uh, dependency structure and, and the graph that relates these variables together. All right, so I did this. Um, so yeah, in the last uh, five years, we've been busy uh, working on incorporating some of these inductive biases in deep learning. Um, uh, so some of the early work, like the recurrent independent mechanisms paper was about neural nets with uh, modular structure that use attention to decide how information is uh, communicated between the modules. And then uh, we and then we incorporated a, a strong constraint about how these modules could collaborate with each other, communicate with each other. That comes from a the say that, let's say the dominant theory of conscious processing in the brain called the global workspace theory. Um, that is illustrated actually in the figure where uh, we have this blackboard, uh, this working memory, which is very small. Uh, and there's a competition between the experts uh, to decide uh, which small subset of them is gonna be able to write information into this um, uh, working memory. And then that gets broadcast to everyone else. So it's a particular mode of communication. There are many ways that modules could communicate with each other, but this one is directly inspired by uh, all of the observations coming from cognitive neuroscience. Um, in a later paper, um, we made the connection between these, uh, these modular architectures and uh, classical ideas in uh, symbolic AI, but using, so production systems, uh, but using these neural modules um, to implement in a kind of soft way with distributed representations, something uh, that was analogous. And, um, and uh, also started to explore uh, another inductive bias I didn't mention, but I'll talk about, which is the, the, the thoughts we have, have at least some aspects of them that is clearly discrete. You know, those words, they, they were like discrete choices. It's either cat or dog. Um, and uh, and of course, if you know anything about deep learning, you probably know that it relies heavily on continuous valued variables and functions that are uh, doing the work so that we can use gradient-based optimization. Um, so what happens when you introduce discretization in the communication between different parts? And in fact, we showed that this can help um, out of distribution generalization and we have uh, kind of theories about why this would be the case. Um, yeah, so uh, still talking about this uh, discrete aspect, that's interesting. And of course, language is like this. Um, what happens in your brain when you become conscious of something uh, has been studied by a neuroscientist. And there is a phenomenon called conscious ignition, kind of a, a large part of your cortex seems to light up and, um, and the dynamics of the activity of neurons seem to converge to an attractor. Um, so what's interesting about attractors is that they are mutually exclusive, which means they form a discrete set. So my current theory is that there's a double nature to our thoughts. On the one hand, they are discrete because if, if conscious ignition means you kind of choose one attractor. Um, it's one particular uh, configuration and not, not another attractor. So that's that there's, there's a, this exclusivity is, is a, the discrete nature, right? Um, but then of course, 
that point in the space of activity of your brain is a high dimensional vector space that's very rich. And, um, and that may explain this uh, mystery that philosophers have been pondering for a long time about the ineffable quality of subjective experience. And, and this is something we're working on these days to develop this idea. All right, so um, I'm now gonna kind of switch gear a little bit and go to words, maybe solutions, like uh, in going beyond the current deep learning methods uh, to incorporate uh, more of these inductive biases uh, to reflect uh, what may be going on in our brain when we are reasoning, when we are imagining, when um, uh, we are facing new situations. And so we introduced this uh, new uh, framework for training neural nets that can generate compositional objects. Uh, the idea is these objects might be things like your thoughts. Um, so uh, more concretely from a computer science perspective, think of these objects as sets or graphs, but any kind of data structure that you could represent in, in a computer um, uh, presumably uh, could fit. Um, and what these GFL nets do, they're uh, somewhat um, uh, you know, inheriting properties from reinforcement learning, from generative models, and also from variational approaches in probabilistic modeling. And so they can represent these distributions, they can sample from them, um, they can represent objects that can be constructed sequentially in any order. So there could be many ways that you can construct a graph, for example. Uh, and even though this involves apparent intractability, uh, they learn intermediate quantities, which we call flows, that implicitly marginalize over uh, like future choices. And um, yeah, so let me try to be a little bit more concrete. So these GFLNS, they learn a policy that's going to construct sequentially compositional objects. I'm going to take the example of graphs because it's easier to understand. So how could you construct a graph sequentially? You can add one edge at a time, for example. And how could we do that? Well, we could train a policy that uses a neural net. In this case, it would be something like a graph neural net because this is the kind of architecture that can take a graph as input. And the output of that graph neural net would be a set of probabilities for the different actions. Here, the actions would be at a particular edge. And then of course you would sample from that distribution. So that you know, cho chooses uh, an edge and that edge could be added to the graph. We now have a slightly bigger graph and we can repeat over and over in order to construct our graph. Of course, we need a special action as well that says, oh, we're done. We have the graph that we're looking for. And we're gonna be able to train this neural net so that it generates graphs with a particular distribution that's going to be specified by a reward function in the same style as in reinforcement learning, except that uh, instead of trying to find the graph that gives you the largest reward, it would sample graphs with probability proportional to that reward. And, and that's a major distinction that is very interesting in many ways. And I'll come back to, if you wanna learn more about GFLNets, I will continue talking about their applications now. I have written a tutorial uh, that you can hopefully find easily online. So GFlowNet here is just a, a short hand for generative flow network. And, uh, and we now have like 11 papers or 12 papers written on this. Um, most of them you can find on the tutorial page. Okay, now, as I said, these GFlowNets allow us to sample proportionally to some function. And I'm going to um, the next slide show how that can be used to sample from Bayesian posteriors. But before I go into this kind of technical detail, let me try to motivate why, why being Bayesian might be interesting. Uh, and of course, for those who already are convinced, it's obvious, but um, still like the vast majority of researchers and, and papers in machine learning do not take that stance. Um, and, and there are reasons for that. So first of all, I was very much inspired by uh, human intelligence and there's lots of evidence 
pointing in a direction that humans are taking decisions in ways that seem to fit the, the Bayesian posterior story. Now, why would that be a good thing from a, an evolutionary perspective for humans and animals to, to, to act in this way? Well, the, the, the simple way to describe what, uh, uh, you know, taking decisions in, in the Bayesian way means is that if you have multiple theories that are compatible with the data and your prior, then you should not just pick one of them and, and, and act accordingly. You should act with the knowledge of that uncertainty and that ambiguity. And that's quite important. Otherwise, if you just focus on one of the theories that, that are compatible with the data, like maybe a neural net that you know uh, fits well with the data, that neural net could be confidently wrong. That means it can make a prediction with uh, uh, say about a, a category, turn right, turn left. And it's sure that really we have to turn right. And yet this could be catastrophic. And of course we don't want that in systems that we deploy. There's another reason why you, you wanna be Bayesian. And that is if you're in a setting where you can act in the world and that action can help you improve your model like scientists, I'll come back to that. Um, so uh, really you'd like to do experiments in the world uh, like children playing that will reduce the uncertainty that you have about which theory is correct to explain your data. Um, so why is it that um, it hasn't um, caught up in the state of the art in, in AI? Um, one possible explanation is that, well, doing this is fine when you have two theories, but in general, you're gonna have a, you know, a, a, an exponential number of theories or even a continuum of theories. And, and, uh, and doing the required sums or integrals is intractable in general. So what people have done mostly is uh, make very strong unrealistic assumptions about the underlying distribution in order to make those calculations easier in, in one form or another. But one important message of my talk is that precisely because of the progress in deep learning in recent years, precisely because we've shown, for example, with large language models and DALI and things like this, that we can train them um, with a large number of examples um, to represent very, very complicated distribution, not perfectly, but amazingly complicated distributions. Um, we can use similar machinery to learn the Bayesian posteriors. So something that looks intractable can become uh, well approximated, including the fact that these posterior distributions are gonna be highly multimodal. All right. So uh, I guess this was more or less my next slide. Um, instead of using something like Monte Carlo Markov chains to sample from the posterior, which is the gold standard in, in Bayesian machine learning, um, we could use an idea called amortization, which has been around for a few years, uh, but I think becomes particularly relevant um, it, when we have those tools, these large neural nets. Um, and, and especially when the distribution we'd like to represent is very rich, may have an exponential number of modes because of compositional structure precisely. The, the uh, MCMC method has trouble mixing between these modes and the traditional variational inference methods tend to be mode seeking. So they will you know, converge to maybe one mode typically or uh, have a hard time finding uh, many of the modes. Um, these g as I've been talking about actually can represent very rich posterior distributions. And, um, and in fact, learn to implicitly modulize over all of these modes. So you don't even need to like visit them explicitly. And of course, this amortization also has a benefit at runtime. You can get answers quickly. You don't need to do like thousands or, or millions of sampling in order to um, average, to get the sort of average answer that you would normally want from a Bayesian decision-making. So, so how is it that the, these g nets can learn to represent Bayesian posteriors? Well, um, you have to remember what these Bayesian posteriors are. So if you have say some parameter theta and some uh, data D, we'd li you'd like to uh, be able to sample from or represent P of theta given D. Uh, 
And that's proportional by Bayes' rule to the prior P of theta times the likelihood P of D given theta. But I note the proportional right here. Okay, so the, the prior times likelihood is actually something easy to compute. But uh, the problem is this normalizing constant that goes with it and, and being able to sample according to that. But the GFLOW nets, if you remembered one sentence I said earlier, are trained to sample objects, like think of theta, um, with probability proportional to some given reward function. So if we make the reward function be the prior times the likelihood, then we can train a GFLOW net to sample from the posterior. And we've, we've done that um, in several settings. Um, so actually the, the, the first paper where we've been doing this is this UAI uh, August um, conference paper uh, called Bayesian Structure Learning with Generative Flow Networks. And it is about sampling from the posterior over causal graphs. So if you're trying to figure out among a bunch of random variables, um, the graph that connects direct cause to its direct effects. Um, uh, you know, this is this is a, it's a very challenging problem in in uh, causal um, what's called causal discovery, and we've been using GFLOW nets to learn that posterior distribution. So even though we cannot enumerate all the graphs, there's a super exponential number of these direct to the cyclic graphs. Um, we can represent that distribution and we can sample from it. And then we can, we can do averaging uh, for answering specific questions. So this is what we've done. Um, what we've also been doing is uh, starting to explore how we can use these ideas in scientific applications context. And I guess I'll use the last five minutes for this. Um, the, this is something I got into because of COVID, as I said at the beginning. Um, we're getting into an era where in many sciences, like in, in biology was where you know, I got uh, hooked. Uh, we are able to run high throughput experiments where the number of experiments could be like in the millions in parallel. And the amount of data is also like in the millions and human brains are not really good at, at that scale, uh, except if both inputs and outputs are images or something, which is not always possible. So, um, so you know, how can machine learning help? Well, let's step back and consider the experimental cycle um, that is typical in many sciences. So we have some experimental data um, we are going to analyze it, model it somehow. And we'd like our model to be able to reveal uh, uh, explanatory hypotheses that, that contradict each other. So we may have several hypotheses that can explain the data. And remember, you know, that's exactly what the Bayesian question was about. I have data and I have many ways of explaining it and would like to take that into account. So what do I want to do with those hypotheses? I want to design experiments for the next round um, that will help to uh, reject some of these hypotheses that will help to discriminate among those hypotheses. So this is called experimental design. And, and then we have experiments. Uh, and, and you can also have machine learning in, in the experiments because now more and more of these things use robots. But, but you know, I'm going to say we can use machine learning and pretty much all of these steps. So let's go a little bit quickly through those. Um, uh, I guess I don't, yeah, maybe I'm not going to go through too much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain first um, this question about how we do the experimental design um, is, is related to a, a notion called epistemic uncertainty. So your model has uncertainty about different experiments. And you'd like to do experiments that have a lot of uncertainty, but not any kind of uncertainty. So the, the, uh, the reducible uncertainty, in other words, the uncertainty that could be reduced if I did that experiment. If the uncertainty is due to noise, which, or aleatoric uncertainty, then we don't really want to do that experiment. I mean, that's not a reason for doing the experiment. What we want is uh, to do experiment that's gonna teach us a lot, that can, um, um, uh, change our models so that it 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 will uh, 
uh, do better for uh, that example and, and, and that experiment and many other experiments. So uh, you can see that this kind of uncertainty, as it, and it's called epistemic uncertainty, is, is related to the Bayesian posterior question. In fact, a more and maybe, maybe better way of thinking about it is we'd like to reduce the, um, uh, the um, information. Uh, I mean, we'd like to uh, find an experiment that gives us the most information about the, the correct uh, theory that explains the data. And that could be formalized in various ways. Um, so we've been working on these questions and uh, using uh, neural nets to estimate that, that uncertainty. But we also have been working, again, exploiting this GFlow nets to um, kind of address another problem in experimental design, which is often the number of possible theories or the number of possible experiments we would like to consider is exponentially large. We can't just, even if we were able to estimate how much information gain we would get from each of these experiments, we can't possibly try them all. There's maybe you know 10 to the 60 different uh, small drug-like molecules. We can't, even in the computer, uh, apply a function to each of those 10 to the 60 things. So what's the solution? The solution is to use a generative model um, that will sample, at least one possible solution is to use a generative model that will sample uh, in this huge combinatorial space, uh, maybe just a few thousand or millions, something that computers can deal with, uh, uh, good candidates. In other words, that have a high epistemic uncertainty or high information gain. So uh, you can also use these GFLON nets to do that. And we've written a number of papers for, for that. Um, one reason why you wanna use this strategy of uh, sampling multiple, so I've talked about why we wanna have multiple theories, but why, why do we want to consider uh, a diversity of candidate experiments? Well, for one, you, you might be able to do a lot of experiments in parallel, so you'd like them to be diverse, um, but also um, they're, the way that we are gonna be evaluating uh, you know, these experiments, the scoring them might be imperfect. So for example, if you think about drugs, the ultimate way of testing a drug is, is a human clinical trial, and it's you know it's, it may cost a hundred million dollars and take a lot of time. But we we can have much cheaper ways. For example, we can test on on mice, or we can have um, in vitro screening, you know, in, in in a test tube, and then we can you know in the test tube we could maybe test thousands or even millions in some cases of of candidates. So uh, these cheaper ways of evaluating our uh, theories or our candidate experiments uh, are not perfect. Uh, they are missing uh, some of the attributes of the expensive uh, evaluation. And so when we generate our candidates um, that have been kind of uh, obtained from a model that's been trained using these proxies, because we can't get a million uh, clinical trials, but we, we can get a million examples from in vitro experiments. So it's been trained on these in vitro data and um, and so we'd like to generate a, a bunch of candidates that uh, that are diverse, so that if uh, if because if they were all like a small variation on the same theme, um, they might all fail together. Whereas if we have a diverse set, uh, hopefully you know some will survive the uh, the, the fact that they they were not uh, optimized uh, for the right quantity. All right, so yeah, I think I'll stop here. We wrote a bunch of papers that evaluate that, that the ability to generate these diverse candidates uh, in molecular space, in the space of biological sequences for materials, for drugs, uh, but I'd rather spend the time answering questions. So thank you very much, Joshua. Very interesting and inspiring. So I will, uh, um, I will actually try to read some of the questions that are coming in in the chat. And uh, maybe that's the probably, I mean, since the number of people that are actually currently connected is still under 80, I mean, I would say that probably is the most efficient way. So a uh, question here coming from uh, uh, Jan um, is, uh, uh, I'm curious about uh, this uh, GFlow net uh, in the context of machine learning for education. 
So uh, he was, he's mentioning a company that uh, apparently is connected to you, Corbit AI. Yes. Uh, how far in the future does uh, uh, do you see GFN be used to discover how to transfer knowledge to humans in education and find optimal learning paths in a in a, in a curriculum? Discovering yeah, uh, a ca causality in educational problems. Right. right. This is a great question. So Corbett was created by one of my grad students and uh, it's doing well. Um, and it's one of those rare ed tech uh, startups that uh, uses uh, deep learning um, in a very sophisticated way, uh, both to do dialogue with the user, the learner, human learner, and um, to design the personalized curriculum. I think this part about, I mean, so there's already a lot of work on, on dialogue using deep learning. I think it could get better in the future, but um, but I think the part about dialogue is interesting. Uh, so you might think that you want to use standard reinforcement learning here of the kind, you know, I give you an exercise and, and now you're going to be uh, doing better on future exercises. Um, but it's hard to, to, uh, to kind of get um, a good, proxy for you're going to be doing better in the future and so you you'd like to edge your bets by using something that is more exploratory um and and re and, and gflanets are exactly like that so that that's actually i didn't think about it it's, a, it's an interesting thought thanks uh, jan so um uh, the question here about that just came, it came to me, not it's not in the chat fully, is uh, uh, from uh, Dionea. Is uh, are there exploratory, exploratory hypotheses that link uh, causality to fractals? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know if you ever thought. Well, about I mean, I mean, I mean, you can, you can. That's the beauty of uh, how our mind works. I can find connections. I don't know if there are explanatory hypotheses. So you probably know that fractals were discovered in the context of modeling um, atmospheric uh, dynamics, and uh, and of course this is a causal model that was hypothesized and it seemed simple enough, but it turned out that uh, the dynamics uh, had uh, you know, fractal properties. Um, but otherwise, I don't think there's like a real link. Or maybe I don't see it. Yeah, well, <laughs> very expl uh, exploratory. Uh, I think it's an interesting question. So I was actually, uh, let me add my personal uh, uh, bit. So. Uh, this uh, um, D-Flow net, uh, uh, no, uh, yes, so G-Flow net, uh, yes, yes. net. So uh, the example about uh, the graph, right? I mean, you are essentially yes. building a graph in a sequential way. Do you yes. see these connections uh, with, uh, I mean, what you know I care about? So, for example, uh, discrete optimization, so the way in which uh, uh, you can think yes. about uh, building solutions for problems. Actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, in the world of uh, discrete optimization, uh, we are typically focusing on optimizing, right? And so uh, there's been some work trying to apply reinforcement learning, which is looking for a strategy that in the end gives you the largest reward, like maybe you know getting your costs as low as possible under constraints. Um, but often, as Andrea and I have been like you know discussing uh, a while ago, um, you're not able to easily measure the, the thing you care about um, right away because it would involve like solving the full problem. So you you may be using proxies that that approximate that or give you some clues about that. And so in this context, um, uh, it might be beneficial to, to use something that's more exploratory, that, that is gonna sample among all the things that could be good. And, and, and that one thing we've observed is that this helps um, avoiding getting stuck. So one thing, one bad thing that happens with the standard RL often is the system finds a good solution but then if you change things a little bit, so that's the robustness aspect I talked about at the beginning. If, if, um, if the setup changes a little bit, then the solution is brittle. Whereas if your system has seen many different solutions, 
uh, to the same problem, then it can, you know, if one of the solutions doesn't work, it, it has the others, right? So it, it has a kind of, it has more uh, options in its, uh, in its bag. Yes, yes, the, I, I see that this was also, I mean, my question also came in to other questions in the, in the chat uh, by others, so it's good. Um, I see, I mean, I can sample, there are many questions in the chat, maybe we should actually save them somewhere. Uh, and um, and uh, I see one, for example, uh, if, are there uh, uh, molecular candidates, I mean, how, how, how how far uh, the the work on the molecular uh, uh, molecular candidates identification with the uh, uh, GFLONETs uh, going? So is it actually something that is uh, as already some clinical testing uh, uh, trials going on, or uh, or is it a bit uh, no this point? no no we we <laughs> that that would take more time. Um, mm -hmm. But I can tell you that uh, the pharma industry is very very interested and. Uh, there's, there's a whole large group of people now at, at Mila working on, you know, with like five or six different farmers that are interested mm -hmm. in this kind of thing. Um, and, 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 but, you know, so what we have done is uh, used existing data sets, like the standard thing we do in machine learning, we use benchmarks to show that you can find uh, like better solutions uh, in, in the sense of these data sets and more diversity, as I said, which is practically important for the reasons I tried to explain. Um, but, uh, and, and we're focusing on something also that industry is not really sufficiently taking, you know, doing uh, much research on, which is antimicrobial resistance. In other words, new antibiotics. We don't have uh, new antibiotics coming at a sufficient rate. Uh, it's almost a zero right now. And these bugs are mutating. Uh, to be resistant to the current drugs. So we, we, there's, there's an increasing number of people who are going to be dying uh, in coming years uh, to the tune of like 10 million people by 2050 per year um, because we don't have drugs to deal with that. Um, and uh, this is, you know, uh, not using GFLONETs, but some of the folks at MIT, um, like uh, Virginia Barzillet, um, actually discovered a new antibiotic using uh, machine learning methods. So uh, I think this this is something that scientists uh, in academia ought to be working on because it's one of these challenges uh, for humanity, but it doesn't get nearly as much publicity as climate change, which also matters, of course. Of course. And actually, uh, as a curiosity here in the drug discovery part and the big pharma that you were talking about, is it actually uh, relatively uh, easy uh, in a certain sense to get data from them at this point in time? Or uh, they are they worried? Uh, are they? I mean, it's a classical question, right? I mean, you need a lot of data yeah, yeah. for this kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. Is it, uh... So yes and no. I mean, um First of all, there's uh, there are there are public data sets, and they do contribute to adding to that. Um, but the the data that is really precious for them because it, it, you know it, it's about commercially important targets that they have, like cancer and things like this. They they don't share, and it's it's a big problem in the industry. Like everybody loses in some sense, especially now that we are using more and more machine learning in the drug discovery world. Um, and I'm trying to convince, uh, you know, governments that if they hand out money to these companies for one reason or another, they should constrain them to use that money to generate data that's going to be shared. Because uh, like, humanity's uh, well-being is at stake. Yes, of course. So I'm actually really sampling over questions here on the chat. So there's one that says we have been doing uh, from Baja. Uh, we have been doing uh, um, system one type implicit learning with back propagation uh, with quite success. Are we as, uh, well, as we expand to uh, explicit learning with the, the, what you call the deep learning 2.0, will we need the new learning algorithms or will back propagation continue to rule? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I do think that uh... Computing gradients with backprop is extremely powerful. And in GFLONETs, we do uh, still use backprop, but we optimize a funny objective function. So the true objective function we'd like to optimize with these uh, probabilistic settings like you know, Bayesian and, and latent variables and stuff, 
is usually intractable. You can't even compute the loss function that you would like to optimize. And, um, and so you could not even apply the standard methodology in, 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 uh, in deep learning. But what you can do is you know, design some proxy like in, in variational methods using uh, the evidence lower bound. And we proposed a different proxy in, in GFlow nets, but that it's related. Um, and so, but we, at the end of the day, we still end up with an objective function that we are minimizing. And it's, it's a little bit different because a little bit like in RL, you also have to worry about where you get your data from. So you're gonna have a policy that chooses where you want the system to be trained. Um, so it's not exactly fitting the standard deep learning framework, but it, it has many of its ingredients. But then it, it becomes an issue is it for that objective function that we're thinking, uh, I mean, for this nets, uh, is because it's not differentiable, so you have to find a proxy because of that? No, or, it's, uh... it is different. No, it is differentiable. It's mm -hmm. just like the correct thing is is a, is an intractable sum. Okay. okay. Like sum over an exponential number of terms or an integral or, or, or in high dimension. Mm -hmm. So so now we're going to have to use some some approximation of this, right? Um, mm -hmm. But what we show in our map is that if you're um, if you have enough capacity in your neural net and you train for long enough, then you can you can approximate these intractable sums uh, arbitrarily well. And it's not about the amount of data you have; it's about how long you're willing to train the system, which is a very different question. So you disentangle the question of having enough data. So you may have a problem where there is not that much data, but still the the learning or the inference problem from a probabilistic perspective is intractable. And there, you, but you can you can have, a, I mean, if you have a lot of compute, then you can approximate the correct thing uh, as closely as you can afford. So I take one last question here from uh, Ao Yang is, do you think that uh, with causal, uh, causal inference and the ability to handle out of distribution data, adversarial examples won't be a problem anymore? Um, I think it's going to help, but, uh, you know, humans also are, you know, we have adversarial examples for humans, for example, optical illusions and, uh, you know, fantasies like gods and stuff. Um, so, you know, there probably will remain, I mean, uh, with finite amount of data, there will be ambiguity anyways, and finite compute though, you know, nothing is ever going to be perfect. So I think indeed that using uh, better models that include this robustness that comes from um, a causal structure will help to deal with a lot of the issues um, in adversarial learning. I mean, what we want really is not that you're gonna be completely immune to these adversarial examples, but you want to have, you wanna have systems that make errors that are you know, similar not much worse than the kinds of errors that humans make. Like if if we have a, a, a system that would make an error that a two-year-old would not do, that we don't trust that system. Yeah. If it makes errors that humans would make, then okay, well, we can live with it. I mean, because we live with other humans. Absolutely. Uh, Joshua, thank you very much. It was actually, as usual, very uh, nice and inspiring. And uh, the fact that you have been always a uh, uh, let's say always willing to actually talk about your work and uh, and sharing with everyone so it's uh, refreshing and uh, thank you again and uh, we hope to see you in person in here at Cornell Tech uh, at some point soon thank you thank for the invitation you. and thanks for the attention and the questions bye 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 thank you everyone for attending and